morning. I'd like to call your attention to Acts chapter 15 this morning. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and be turning there. Acts chapter 15, and we're going to cover most of this chapter this morning, so I'll let you guys stay seated. We're going to begin reading this morning. Acts chapter 15, I'll begin verse number 1. I'll begin reading there, and you guys again can stay seated. The Bible says this, Acts chapter 15, beginning verse number 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this, about this question. Verse number 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows them, or who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Notice verse number 11, guys. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it and that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Verse 19. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. From from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, the brothers who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings, since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, though we gave them no instruction. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men to descend them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have therefore sent Judas and, and Silas, who themselves would tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Just a few more verses, guys. Verse number 30. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent. 
But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. We're going to stop there this morning. We'll, I think it would be wise to pick up in verse 36 next week. So let's go, Lord, and pray, then we'll get started. Uh, Lord, thank you again for allowing us to, to have the chance to read your word. Uh, it may be a temptation in some of our hearts already to, to begin to tune out because we read so much scripture this morning. But, but Lord, we know that you speak through your word, and, and this is real history of the church. So, Lord, I just ask that you keep all of our minds attentive and clear this morning and help us not to be distracted by lesser things. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, take hold of this truth and work it deep into our soul that salvation is by grace through faith. And, and help us to, to look within our hearts, Lord, that point out any area in our life in which we're relying on other things for salvation. Uh, Lord, help us to, again, work this deep into our hearts so that we're able to speak this truth when we encounter people in our community who are just constantly weighed down by trying to do good works in order to get to heaven. Lord, again, help us to see the importance of this passage for our life and how it's important in the life of your church. Uh, Lord, help us now, and, and we're going to rely on your spirit, and we're, we're excited about what you're going to do uh, through the invitation this morning. Uh, Lord, help us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, so what we're doing here is we're going to see what we call the Jerusalem Council. Now, if you've ever been to Sunday school or if you've ever studied through Acts, you may have heard that name before, but you didn't know how it really connected to Scripture. So what's taking place here, I, I just want to say on the onset before we even begin, my goal this morning is not to have a uh, class about church history 101 during our, our worship time. That's, that's not my aim this morning. But if you were to look throughout church history, you would see there's different times in the church's history that different doctrinal issues arose. And so they would bring together all the religious leaders and they would meet to settle these issues. Now, there's different councils all throughout church history, but we read about the very first one this morning here in Acts chapter 15. Uh, and that's called the Jerusalem Council. So all these different leaders, these apostles are coming together to settle a doctrinal issue. Now, what was the issue that was going on within the early church? What was the question that they were going to ask at this meeting? The question was this, what must a man do in order to be saved? How could a man inherit salvation? How, do, how does that happen? Well, what was taking place here is you had two different lines of thought. There's two different types of people. You had what we call the Judaizers. Now the Judaizers said that you had that salvation come through Christ plus something else. In their case, it was circumcision by keeping the law, by doing traditional things. But then you have the apostles here at the church that were in the other side of the ring who said that salvation was Christ plus nothing else. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to see where the church landed on this issue, and then we're going to use that to fuel our, our doctrine, our theology, because Raymond needs to be shaped by what the Bible says. So that's what we're going to look at here this morning. This council that we read about here in Acts chapter 15 settles for all times that salvation is by grace through faith. It's not salvation, it's not Jesus plus baptism that gets you to heaven. It's not Jesus plus joining a church. It's not Jesus plus tithing. It's not that. It's just salvation is by grace through faith. It's what Christ has done, not what we do. So how did they come to this conclusion here in the early church? We're going to notice this situation unfolds in four different parts. The first part that we see is this. we we see the disagreement. We see that in the first five verses. Now look in your Bibles at uh, verse number 1 of Acts chapter 15. Now I want to remind you that, that false teaching is not something new. It's not something that's just occurred in the past 100 years. False teaching actually has been around ever since the start of the church. In fact, the Bible says this in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse number 1. The Bible says, But false prophets also arose among the men, just as there will be false teachers among you. So again, he's warning, hey, there's going to be false teachers even today who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, 
even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destructions upon themselves. Another passage warning about false teaching is Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30. The Bible says this, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, and draw the disciples after them. One of the most destructive teachings that have ever come into the church is that salvation involves human works. And it's introduced here in Acts chapter 15. Look at verse number 1, guys. The Bible says this, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, what's taking place here is these folks have come in. And they start teaching dangerous lies within the church. And it's creating a division within the church. Here in verse number 1. So essentially what these Judaizers are saying to the Gentiles. Judaizers are the people that say salvation plus something else. The Gentiles are just these new converts. They've just heard the gospel and they've believed. What they're saying to them is, hey, you've got to be circumcised first before you can get saved. Now this... These Gentiles thought, wait, wait a second. The preacher gave an invitation. He said, all I got to do is believe in Christ, surrender, surrender my life to him, surrender his lordship, and I'll be saved. The Gentiles thought, hey, I'm, I'm legitimate. But now these people have come in and said, no, it's, you got to do something else. Do you see the problem right here? They believe salvation solely come through Christ, but somebody's teaching them something else. They're telling the, the Gentiles that their faith is actually fake. Now look in your Bibles at verse number 2. You're going to need your Bibles this morning. Keep tracking along. The Bible says this, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Now let's stop right there. What are Paul and Barnabas doing when these false teachers come in? They're acting like good shepherds. They're trying to keep the flock safe from these. They're essentially fighting for the truth. They're guarding the flock. Well, why would they do that? Well, they knew that if this issue wasn't settled at this church, false doctrine is very dangerous because it spreads like wildfire. It, it doesn't just affect one church. False doctrine begins to spread through other churches. So Paul and Barnabas knew, hey, we got to pull this bad root up before it grows into other plants and begins to spread. So that's exactly what they're going to do. Look in verse number two at the very last part. The Bible says this, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So you guys remember where they're at right now is, is basically a church plant. The, the church first started there in Jerusalem and Antioch is, is, is kind of a church plant. So they say, all right, let's go back to Jerusalem to where the church first started. Let's ask them what they think. So they load up and they get, they put on their Jerusalem. They're little sandals, and they're off for... That was a joke, guys. Uh, they're off for a hike. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says this, So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. So they're headed back to Jerusalem. They're going to have a big meeting there and, and, and ha make a decision about this. But why does the Bible say in verse number 3 they're passing through other towns? Because Paul and Barnabas are going around and say, Hey, the Lord's converted Gentiles. Basically, he's raising support for his case as he goes to make it there in Jerusalem at the council. Now, these towns that were just described, they're full of Gentiles. So he's gaining a lot of support. He's, he's getting a lot of backing as he goes. Now, look at verse number four. The Bible says, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. So they finally make it back to where, all, where it all first started. And they start talking about the spiritual victories and, and all these casualties and just basically all that God had done through their ministry so far. Now, you would think everybody would be excited, right? Oh, the Gentiles have been converted. There's so many pe new churches have been started. People are, being, are getting saved. But not everyone was glad about the news that they're hearing from Paul and Barnabas. In fact, look at verse number five. The Bible says this, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, hey, it's necessary to circumcise them in order 
and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So they get back to Jerusalem and there's people there that are even say, hey, you're going to have to make them do this in order that they can be saved also. What these people are doing is they're, they're mixing, basically what they're doing, they're mixing human works with faith. And that's wrong. It's salvation by grace through faith. Again, it's nothing that we do. Anytime we add something to Christ for salvation, it's wrong. Now, why is that wrong? When we add something else to salvation, what we're saying is that Christ is not enough. When you say that you've got to add something to salvation, such as baptism, such as works, or, or in this case, circumcision, you're saying that, that Christ isn't the 100% complete Savior. Let's say you decide to build this bridge to heaven, and, and it consists of 99% Christ and 1% human works. Guess what that bridge is going to do? It's going to crumble. It's, it's not going to hold up underneath pressure. Well, let's say you, well, I, I know Christ is going to carry me to heaven, but I'm also going to work too. So Christ carries you 999 miles, and you think you're going to carry yourself the right, the, that last mile to heaven, you're going to be burdened down. You're not going to be able to do it. It's still going to be too far. The point is this. It has to be Christ that carries you all the way. It has, that bridge to heaven has to be 100% Christ or it's going to crumble. And that's the problem here in Acts 15 is, is the bridge that these Judaizers had built to heaven, it didn't consist 100% of Christ. It, they said that, that you had to be circumcised also. If you're taking notes this morning, Romans chapter 3, verse number 28, it's very helpful. The Bible says this, For we hold that one is justified by what? How are we justified? By faith apart from works of the law. We're justified by faith. The good news for us this morning as New Testament believers is we no longer have to be burdened down by the Old Testament, the Old Testament law. We're free from that. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21 says this. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Because we're free from the burden of keeping Old Testament law. Now, let's, let's keep going here in, in Scripture. We're going to look at verse number 6. Not only have we seen uh, this disagreement, but now we're going to start talking about the discussion that they have. In fact, uh, look at verse number 6. The Bible says this, The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. So there's a problem. Now they're going to talk about it. Now the thing is, here in Acts, Luke doesn't give us a detailed uh, report of that meeting. Why was that? Well, what we see here in verse number 6 is it's just the leaders who have met together. The whole congregation isn't there inside this meeting as they begin to debate these matters. But then he resumes with, uh, with the answer to the decision in verse number 7. Uh, let's, let's pick up there. Look at verse number 7. It says, and after, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood and said to them, so here the decision is going to be made by the church. Is, is salvation... By grace through faith, or do we have to add something into it? Now, this decision that was made is revealed uh, in six ways by four different men. First, we're going to see Peter add, teaches the church, and then Paul and Barnabas are going to speak, and then we're going to conclude with James, the half-brother of Jesus. All these guys are going to speak, and that's going to formulate the, the decision that the council's made. And it comes in six, in six ways. And so if you're taking notes this morning, uh, let's, let's go through this together. The first way the response comes is, is they say, past revelation proves salvation is by grace. So what's happened in the past proves, look at verse number 7 again. It says, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you. What's he talking about there? What early days is he referring to? Right next to verse number 7 in your Bibles, I encourage you to write this down. What he's, the situation that Peter's referring to is Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. 
What he's saying here is that in the past, salvation was by grace through faith. The situation that we find there in Acts 10 is a man by the name of Cornelius. He was a Gentile. In order for Cornelius to have been saved, do you know what happened? He just had to believe on the Lord. It was by grace through faith. He didn't require Cornelius to become a Jew first. He just simply had to believe. And that's what he did. And he not only was Cornelius saved, his whole entire household ended up being saved. Now, again, Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, he didn't have to be circumcised. He didn't have to go through all the rituals. The point is this. The point Peter's trying to make is this. You don't have to keep the rituals. You don't have to go through the motions in order to receive salvation. Don't, as Judaizers, they should not require something that God Himself isn't requiring. God had already settled the matter and they're saved. Well, let's keep plowing. The gift of the Spirit proof salvation is by grace. Look at verses 8 and 9, guys. The Bible says this, And God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, He knew that people would say, well, Cornelius wasn't really saved. He's a Gentile. He, he's not really saved because he hasn't gone through the motions yet. But the gift of the Spirit was given to the Gentiles. The gift of the Holy Spirit was also given to Cornelius. God doesn't give the Holy Spirit to people who aren't saved. Which again proves to us, Cornelius and the Gentiles, they were saved. They were seen the same Spirit. In fact, they spoke in the same languages as the people did there at Pentecost. Now if you're looking for, for Scripture references of, of when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, I wrote these down for you guys to jot down. Again, Acts chapter 10 verses 44 and 45 but also Acts chapter 11, verses 17 and 18. The Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit. They were legitimate believers, even though they hadn't been circumcised. Now let's keep going. How do we know this? Cleansing from sin proves that salvation is by grace. Now, where do we see that? Look at verse number 9 at the last part. It says, He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. You see, God was doing a work in the Gentiles' life. And it was way more important for them to be cleansed from the inside out rather than the outside in. You see, when God works in a person's heart, it's not just on the outside that they change. It's from the inside out. Now, some of you guys may be sitting here this morning and you could share your testimony this morning how before Christ you tried to clean yourself up. You tried to do better. You tried to fix your marriage. You tried to stop drinking alcohol or, or fill in the blank. And you know that you were helpless on your own. But who had to change you? It was Christ. And when Christ came in and took up residence and presidents in your life, what happened? He began to change you from the inside out. That's what's happening with these Gentiles. That's how we know they were legitimate believers. They didn't necessarily care what they look like on the outside. They cared what they look like on the inside. And the Bible says that they're being cleansed. Again, affirming that the Holy Spirit had saved them. Cleansing comes from God alone. We can't clean ourselves up. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7 says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Again, Ephesians 1, uh, 7 is saying we're cleansed through His blood, according to the riches of His grace. So if these Gentiles had been cleansed from their sin already because of Christ's blood, how are they going to cleanse themselves anymore by being circumcised? Again, the practical application of this is when Christ saves us, when He comes in and begins to clean our heart, we can't clean ourselves up anymore by doing something else. It is Him, it's through His blood that we're made clean not through other things. Does this make sense so far, guys? All right, let's keep plowing. The next uh, thing I, I want us to see here is the inability of the law to save proves salvation is by grace. Look in your Bibles at verse number 10. It says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? 
But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Now, Peter's warning them, hey, don't challenge God's glorious, gracious gospel. And what he's saying is it's foolish to load these guys down with the law whenever Jesus himself said in in Matthew 23, verse number 4, they tie up heavy loads and lay on them men's shoulders. It's pointless to tell these new converts, hey, now you need to keep all this. You've got to do this in order to be saved. Because God had already taken that burden off of them in the new covenant. Don't go back to the old covenant. Christ has made a new one. one we, couldn't, we couldn't carry, we couldn't shoulder the weight of all this Old Testament requirements. That's why Christ come. Again, Salvation is not by keeping all these laws. Salvation is through Christ. What he's teaching here is, is, well, let's keep going right quick. We've got a lot of ground to cover. What I like most as Peter concludes his little talk is verse number 11. Look there with me, guys. The Bible says this, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. So again, Peter concludes his speech by affirming salvation is by grace through faith. Now, verse number 12, we see the facts of the miracles prove that salvation is by grace. So now somebody else has a turn to speak. What's going to happen now is Paul and Barnabas are going to take the stage. And they've been teaching the whole time this that we've been talking about, that salvation is by grace. And they affirm their message by miracles. For people to believe he confirmed the message by granting different miracles. Now, think about this. The Judaizers who are teaching, they don't have miracles to back up their teaching. But, but Paul and Barnabas do. Their evidence is irrefutable. Nobody can go against that. God, God's stamp of approval is there on those who are teaching. Salvation is by grace through faith. Now, let's keep going. We're up to verse number 13 now. We gotta, we've got we covered a lot of ground. got a little bit more to cover. The prophetic promise proves salvation is by grace. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 13. The Bible says this, After they finished speaking, James replied. So we've heard from Peter. We've heard from Paul and Barnabas. Now we're to James. And this guy was the half-brother of Jesus. He's, he says this, After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has relayed how God first visited the Gentiles to take them to take from them a people for his name. Now what's going to happen now in, in verses 15 and, and following is he's quoting an Old Testament passage. And, and this Old Testament passage is Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. What, what James is saying, hey, God promised that the Gentiles would be saved, that he has chosen a people for himself, and that includes the Gentiles. Now, this is important for us to point out because what James is saying is God chose the Gentile as a Gentile. He didn't choose the, the Gentile that had to become a Jew first. Now, let me explain how this plays out practically. In order for you to be saved, it's not like we welcome people into the church and have to become a member first and dress the way that we dress and do the things that we do in order to be saved. God saves them as they are and then begins to change their heart. Do you see the application there? It's important. So, after all of this is begins to play out, after all the speech is made, now they've got to make a decision. So what side is the church going to camp on? Let's see the decision. This is our third point. And then we're going to go towards the invitation. We see that in verse number 19. All the evidence is presented. Notice what happens next in verse number 19. The Bible says, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Now, who, whose judgment is this in verse 19? It says, Therefore my judgment is. Who's that referring to? That's talking, the person that's speaking there is James. He's the leader of the church there at Jerusalem. So he had a lot of, he had a lot of power there. In the church, he's essentially saying this, that keeping the law, observing the rituals were not requirements of salvation. Guys, listen, I'm thankful that the church sided on that, right? That we don't have to go back to the Old Testament and, and hold all this 
because we couldn't bear it on our own. But he goes on in verse number 19. He says, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. So basically, he's, tr- he's calling out the, the Judaizers, saying, hey, don't mess with these new converts. Don't be teaching them your garbage, your false doctrine. Don't, don't be doing that anymore. Because this is what God's Word says. This is what the church affirms. And we're going to leave it at that. But, but not only that, he didn't want the Jews to bother the Gentiles, but he didn't want the Gentiles to bother the Jews. Now, he didn't want the Gentiles to come to the Jews and say, hey, all that Old Testament stuff is done. It's gone. Because he knew that these Gentiles would have these Christian liberties. Hey, we don't have to do that anymore. And that could create uh, some fuss within the church. So notice verse number 20, what they do. The Bible says this, But should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. What they, they didn't want these new Gentiles, after they received the news, to destroy their testimony in the community. Say, hey, I don't have to do the Old Testament anymore. I can do whatever I want. I'm saved by the blood. I, I can do whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. So what they decide to do is to send letters out to all the church about this decision. But with the letters, they're sending other men with them. Well, why would they do that? If these people have traveled from Antioch, I forgot my map this morning, but they're traveling from Antioch to Jerusalem, and then they've got to go back and report. Well, they know Paul and Barnabas are partial. They've got to send other people back with them. The more people that go, they know, okay, this really is real. Gentiles are truly saved when they turn to Christ. So let's keep, let's keep going here. Now that this doctrinal issue is resolved, they got to turn again to the fellowship issue. So they write this letter. Uh, look at verse number 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders and the whole church to choose men from among them and send with them to Antioch, Paul and Barnabas. So they're going back anyways. But they also sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas leading men from among the brothers. So the head honchos are, are going back with them. And then, whenever you get to verse number 23, that's the actual letter that they sent out to the churches. And it goes all the way. Uh, verse 23 starts the letter. But we're going we're gonna to pick up on down. Now, look at verse number 30. That's the end of the letter. It says, So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. So they say their goodbyes, they they pack their uh, saddlebags, they head back with the letter, and when they're there, the entire congregation at Antioch had been waiting anxiously to see, hey, is my faith genuine? Is Am I a legitimate believer? Now, what were their responses when they hear the news? There's four responses of these people of these Gentiles, and we see this in Scripture. Uh, the first response of these people, uh, look at verse number 31. It says, when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Hey, these people that hear that they don't have to do anything else to be saved, their first response is they rejoice. They're excited. They realize that this burden had been lifted off of them for, for however long it had they had to travel. They're thinking in the back of their mind, am I really saved? They needed that assurance of salvation. So they rejoiced. That's their first response. But also, the second response was consolation. So this fear had been lifted. Their salvation was before was not guaranteed, or so they thought. You know, friends, that's what legalism does to us. Those that preach this false gospel that says salvation... It's Christ plus something else. Do you know what that does to us? It produces fear in our hearts. It produces guilt. Uh, there's different men that I have uh, had the pleasure of meeting with over the past couple of years that come from different denominational backgrounds that are still living with fear and anxiety that they're not doing enough. And so whenever we land on the side that salvation is by grace, do you know what that produces in our heart? freedom and hope for i hope that's where we always land that it's not about us it's what he has done so there was consolation there when they received the news but there's more there's more responses 
Third, there was confirmation. Look at verse number 32. The Bible says this, And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. So again, two leaders from the church at Jerusalem had come, and again, they're affirming the words of Paul and Barnabas. So they again, it's like a stamp of approval. Number four, and then we're going to the invitation. The fourth response was continuation. Look at verse 35. I like this part. It says, But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Now that sounds pretty simple, right? So the issue come up, they dealt with the issue, and then they get right back to it. They keep plowing. That's pretty amazing, right? They get back to doing exactly what they were doing before, preaching and teaching that salvation is 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 by grace through faith. And they don't let up. They continue to pick up where they left off. So you're here this morning. And you're probably, half of you are still asleep. You're asleep. <laughs> I see your eyes. Everybody's perking up now. What's this sermon have to do with me? How can I apply this to my life? Well, if you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and what I mean by that is there's never been a moment in your life where you've turned from your sin and turn to Christ and just ask Him to save you. Friend, listen to me. If you are an unbeliever, if that is true for you this morning, I want you to hear this truth. There has been, and there always will be, only one way to salvation, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only through a relationship with Him. This passage, again, affirms that truth for us. You do not have to do anything in order to accomplish salvation. Salvation has already been accomplished through a man who came and he lived a completely perfect life. He wasn't just a man. He was a God-man. He came and he lived a perfect life and he went to a cross. And he went to die for you and I. But he didn't stay dead, right guys? He rose on the third day showing God was, was satisfied in his death. God's wrath had been appeased. Friend. If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's your only hope. You can spend the rest of your life on the mission field, feeding little kids in Africa, and it still won't be enough. Even on your best day, it won't be good enough. That's the application for you this morning as an unbeliever. But what about the believers here? Those that have turned from sin and self. What does this passage have to do with them? For the believer, we who are under grace... What we need to see in this passage is we should not make non-biblical requirements of other people. You, you see how that happens in the church sometimes? We make our life the form or the mold and everybody else has to form to it instead of allowing God's Word to be the mold in which we're poured into. Like we shouldn't require other people to be like us. We should require other people to be like Christ. For example, how we dress. Like We shouldn't expect other people to dress the way that we do. We should expect them to dress the way God's, God desires. Modesty. Do you see what I mean? Like Not everyone has to wear a tie. That's okay. As long as we're modest. We shouldn't expect people to run the church exactly like we do. We have, we have different leadership styles. We shouldn't compare ourselves to other churches or compare those churches to us and look down on them because they're doing something a little different. What about our standard of living? We look at other people that may not have as much money as us or, or other people that do have more money and sometimes we look down on them. You see how this applies to believers? What about our personal taste? I mean, I can't believe that person drives a Ford or a Chevy or a Kia. I don't know if anybody drives a Kia. If you do, I'm not bashing Kias. I'm just... Anyways, again, we shouldn't impose our personal taste on other people and look down on them as less than or less than holier than our, than us. What about music taste or worship styles? Sometimes we look down on other people and, and impose unbiblical principles on other people. And, and we shouldn't do that. If we try to push any of these things off on other people as necessary for grace, then we're just as guilty as the Judaizers. 
We're just like these people in this passage. It's so easy to push our preferences off on other people. And if we assume, if we see that they're doing things different than us, sometimes we think they're less spiritual. And, and sometimes that's not the case. Sadly, many churches today, and you guys know this, radiate heritage more than they radiate the gospel. And that's a problem. We should radiate what this book says instead of our personal preferences. Let me share an illustration with you and then we'll almost be done. I keep saying that, but we just got a little bit more. Has anybody ever heard of a man named Winston Churchill? Maybe you have. Uh, Winston Churchill told a story one time of a family that went down to the lake for a picnic. Now, this family had a couple of kids, and they're having a great time. But over the course of the day, they noticed next to the lake, their five-year-old son had fallen into the lake. To most of us, that wouldn't be a problem. We'd go fish him out. But the problem for this family was no one could swim. And as they watched, this little five-year-old boy just begin to bobble up and down in the water as he tried to get a breath. They were screaming for help. Well, a man began to walk by, and he noticed all the commotion. So he runs at a dead sprint over to the water. As he sees the little boy began to sink down that third and last time. Well, the man jumped in fully clothed. Thankfully, he reaches the boy, drags the boy to shore. The boy was okay. Now, instead of just uh, thanking this man for his heroic efforts, do you know what the mom did? She snapped at the man and said, where's Johnny's hat? Where, where's his hat? And all the commotion that went on in the boy in the lake, somehow he had lost the hat. But all this lady could do, instead of being thankful for the deliverance of her child, she found something critical to point out. Now, you say, what's this have to do with us in Acts chapter 15? Sadly, many times... We within the church are just like this woman. Instead of rejoicing in the deliverance of people, we like to point out the flaws and, and, and be critical, especially of our brothers and our sisters in Christ. This sort of attitude, this critical attitude, attitude is not only bad for us, it's, I mean, it's dangerous within the church. It's deadly. I want to give you one more principle, and I promise we're going to an invitation. As a believer, because we are under grace, we gladly restrict our freedom for the sake of others. Now, it was not wrong for these Gentiles, now that they had been saved, to eat meat. I mean, they could have went out to the market and just got a big old filet mignon and just ate it raw. Because of the new covenant, they could legally do that. The Old Testament, no, you wouldn't. You had to boil your meat or make sure it's well done. The Gentiles could have done that, but because of Christ, they, I mean, they had, there was a lot of freedom there. Today we call it Christian liberties. But what James says in these final concluding thoughts, he's talking to these Gentiles to say, hey, don't, don't do anything that would cause a riff in the fellowship. I want to read you a passage of Scripture. This is 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 19. It says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. I'm going to explain this in just a second. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. The point is this. We as New Testament believers have so much more freedom than Old Testament saints. There's a lot of things that technically we could do. As long as we have a clear conscience, we could probably do that. Mowing grass on Sunday. Like, technically, we could probably do that. Now, for me, that could be a stumbling block to other people. You're not going to see me mowing grass here at the Parsonage on Sunday because that could cause someone else to stumble. There are people that try to make the case that you could drink alcohol with your spouse in private, and that would be okay, that would be permissible. What 1 Corinthians 9, and I believe this passage affirms, is 
Okay, that might be permissible, but it's not always profitable. Friend, if I walk through Kroger with this, I don't even know what size pack, just a pack of alcohol in my buggy, that's going to cause someone to stumble when they say, hey, he's a pastor of Raymond Baptist Church and he's doing that. I've never had anyone stop me in Kroger when I have Coke Zero in my buggy. They never think. The, the point is this, these Gentiles had to be careful, even though they had freedom in certain things, not to exercise that freedom in order that other people wouldn't stumble. So how does that play out practically in our lives? In 1 Corinthians 9, it's self-denial. Paul leaves us with this, with this example of, though it's permissible, sometimes we shouldn't do that in order that other people wouldn't stumble. Maybe it's the way that we dress. Maybe some people say, well, I can dress this way and uh, there's Christian liberties in that. But you don't dress that way in order to make your to help your brothers in Christ not stumble. You see how this plays out practically? Or there's some Old Testament laws that say you shouldn't trim the sides of your beard. I mean, I think there's Christian liberty. You can use a razor now. I think that's all right. I like using a razor. All you beard wearers, I'm not, I'm not, I hope I'm not offending you this morning. Anyways, the food that we eat, there's Christian liberty in that. I love bacon or anything pork. Like, there's liberty in that. The Sabbath laws, 